Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kate, for the very kind introduction. Hello, everyone. As was said, I will be talking about wobbling motion in 187 gold. We will start by talking about some simple nuclear shapes and introducing the phenomenon of triaxiality. So most nuclear shapes that we encounter are either spherical or are axially deformed and take up shapes like prolate and oblate with majority favoring a prolate deformation. Another shape of interest occurs when axial symmetry is broken and that is manifested as a triaxial deformation, which is shown in this figure at the bottom. A triaxial nucleus is analogous to a triaxial ellipsoid uh, shown in the figure on the right, having three axes each with a different moment of inertia. The three axes of a triaxial nucleus are referred to as the long, medium, and short axes. Triaxiality, however, is a very rare phenomenon, and it is only predicted for a few small regions of the nuclear chart. Back in 2006, this group calculated the relative lowering in the ground state energy when axial symmetry is broken, relative to that in axially asymmetric nuclei. So according to their calculations, they only found these three regions that are shown uh, as colder, bluer regions where strong, well-established triaxiality was found. So since it is a very difficult, uh, it is a phenomenon which is very difficult to uh, establish, we have to rely on certain experimental signatures to identify triaxiality. Two such unique signatures are nuclear wobbling motion shown on the left and chiral rotation in nuclei shown on the right. So if you uh, look at the animation to the left, uh, we have a triaxial nucleus with three axes, S for short axes, L for the long axes, and M for the medium axes. So, uh, little j corresponds to the angular momentum of an odd particle, and then the medium axis oscillates about j, which is the total angular momentum vector. This is the wobbling motion. Now, uh, look at the animation to your right. Um, here, R is the angular momentum of the triaxial rotor. J pi stands for the angular momentum of the odd proton. J nu is the angular momentum of the odd neutron. And with this kind of an arrangement, the total angular momentum vector J points outside of any of the three principal planes. And when that happens, the nucleus starts exhibiting left and right handedness. So this phenomenon is called chiral rotation in nuclei. Now, most uh, of my uh, talk is focused on nuclear wobbling motion. So that's what we will be talking about. But it is important to remember here that the observation of either wobbling motion or chiral, chiral rotation constitutes irrefutable evidence to triaxiality. So coming back to nuclear wobbling motion, which uniquely helps in the identification of triaxial nuclei. As I said, it is the harmonic oscillation of one of the three principal axes. So in this figure, the medium axis about the total angular momentum vector J. It is analogous to the spinning motion of an asymmetric top. Experimentally, wobbling bands are seen as multiple rotational bands, each band corresponding to a particular wobbling phonon number N. Uh, equals zero, one, two, and so on. Then there are connecting transitions between the higher phonon band to its lower phonon counterpart. So one to zero, two to one, and so on. And most importantly, these connecting transitions, even though they are delta i is equal to one, they have a predominant electric quadrupole character. Now, this is a simple wobbler, which was originally described by Bohr and Mortelson. They described wobbling in even even nuclei as small amplitude oscillations of J, the total angular momentum vector about the largest moment of inertia axis, which we must keep in mind for a triaxial nucleus is always the medium axis. Now, if you look at the first expression here, that is the energy of a rigid triaxial rotor. The Js correspond to the angular momentum of the long, short, and medium axes, and the A's are rotational parameters which are inversely proportional to the moment of inertia. Now, since the moment of inertia of the medium axis is the largest, the rotational parameter for that axis would be the smallest. Now, I, I want you to uh, focus on the last equation on this uh, slide, which is 
the expression for wobbling energy, which essentially means the energy associated with wobbling excitations. So here, since AM, which is the rotational parameter corresponding to the medium axis, is the smallest number, uh, both of these brackets return positive values. And so wobbling energy for a simple wobbler was predicted to increase with increasing spin. Now, although wobbling was first predicted in 1975, the first experimental observation came much later in the year 2001 in the nucleus 163 lutetium. This was followed by 167, 165, and 161 lutetium, and uh, finally in 167 tantalum. And for a very long time, it was known in only these five nuclei in the mass 160 region. And further searches outside of this mass region did not bear any fruitful results. But then a breakthrough observation happened in 2015, where for the first time wobbling was found outside of mass 160 region in mass 130 region in the nucleus 135 presidinium. Now, this was an important observation, not just because it indicated mass 130 as a new region of interest where wobbling could be found, but also because for this nucleus, wobbling was based at a much lower deformation of 0.16, uh, whereas for all the previously found wobblers, it was based on a much higher uh, deformation of 0.4. Moreover, um, in 135 presidemium, wobbling excitations were based on an odd H11 half proton configuration, whereas for all the previously known wobblers, it was based on an odd I13 half proton configuration. But we still had a problem. Now, if you remember, uh, we, when we were talking about simple wobblers, it was predicted that wobbling energy should increase with increasing spin. Now on the left here is the experimental wobbling energy for the five lutetium, uh, for the five nuclei in mass 160 region. And on the right is the wobbling energy plot for 135 presidemium. Instead of increasing, all of these were found to uh, exhibit a decreasing trend with increasing spin. So a re-evaluation was required here to determine why there was a discrepancy between the theoretical prediction and the experiment. This discrepancy was resolved by Fraundorf and Dunau by utilizing the quasi-particle triaxial rotor model. They utilized the QTR model to study triaxiality in odd mass nuclei. And they described uh, such a system as the triaxial even-even core, which is coupled to an odd quasi-particle. Now, this quasi-particle is the high angular momentum unpaired proton or neutron, which couples to the triaxial core and provides it with the alignment necessary to undergo wobbling. This alignment also considerably modifies the wobbling motion. Now, depending on how the quasi-particle aligns with the triaxial core, wobbling can further be categorized into two types. So this is the first uh, type of wobbling where the odd particle has aligned parallel to the maximum moment of inertia axis. So if you look to the figure on the left, uh, the odd particle with angular momentum little j has aligned with the medium axis. And then it is the medium axis which wobbles about the space fixed total angular momentum vector j. This arrangement gives uh, rise to what we now call as a longitudinal wobbler. Now, because here is an extra odd particle which is coupled to the triaxial rotor, the associated Hamiltonian and the wobbling energy expression changes. So uh, this uh, very complicated looking equation here is the modified expression for wobbling energy. Now here, um, I1, I2, and I3 are the moments of inertia. I3 corresponds to the moment of inertia of the medium axis and I1 and I2 corresponds to the moments of inertia of the long and the short axis. Now, since I3 is the largest number here, both of these uh, terms, I3 by I1 minus one and I3 by I2 minus one, both of them return positive values. And it is seen that for a longitudinal wobbler, wobbling energy should increase with increasing spin. Now, uh, we look at the other case where instead of aligning with the medium axis, the odd particle prefers to align perpendicular 
to the maximum moment of inertia axis. So either with the short or with the long axis. Now look at the figure to the left here, the odd particle with angular momentum little j has aligned with the short axis. And then it is the short axis which wobbles about the total angular momentum vector. This arrangement gives rise to a transverse wobbler. Now here I3 corresponds to the moment of inertia of the short axis, which is smaller than the moment of inertia of the medium and uh, greater than the moment of inertia of the long axis. So considering these inequalities, it is seen that although the first term here is still positive, the second term I3 by 2 minus 1 returns a negative value. And so for a transverse wobbler, wobbling energy was found to decrease with increasing spin. Now, in light of all these uh, calculations, we uh, re-evaluated the wobbling energy for the known wobblers. So here, um, since we saw that all the uh, wobblers in the mass 160 region and 135 presidemium, they all exhibited a decreasing wobbling energy. It was hence deduced that all of these were actually cases of transverse wobblers where the odd particle has aligned perpendicular to the maximum moment of inertia axis. Um, if you look uh, to the, uh, at the plot here on the right, uh, that's the wobbling energy for 135 presidemium. The black points show the experimental wobbling energy, whereas the dashed blue line corresponds to the QTR uh, prediction, and QTR correctly predicts the decreasing trend in the wobbling energy. Now, going back to the previous cases of wobbling, after the breakthrough observation that was made in uh, 2015 by the observation of the first wobbling band in 135 presidemium, we obtained further confirmation by the existence, by, obtain, uh, by identifying uh, a second wobbling band in this nucleus. This was also seen to exhibit a decreasing wobbling energy, just like the one phonon band in 135 presidemium. Um, this was followed by another observation in mass 130 region in the nucleus 133 lanthanum. Now, this was also an important observation because wobbling energy for 133 lanthanum was found to increase with increasing spin, which we have previously seen is indicative of longitudinal wobbling. So 133 lanthanum was identified as the first case of longitudinal wobbling. Now, uh, wobbling in this nucleus was also based on an odd H11 half proton configuration, just like 135 presidemium. Then we had another observation in mass 100 region in the nucleus 105 palladium. Now, although this was also a case of transverse wobbling, um, this was based on a one neutron configuration. So with all these observations, we, uh, we figured that wobbling is not based is not limited to any particular mass region and can still be observed with different proton and neutron configurations. So moving forward, the most obvious question was, are there any other regions of the nuclear chart where wobbling bands may be observed? We have explored this question by exploring wobbling in mass 190 region in the nucleus 187 gold. Now, why did we choose uh, this particular mass region? Because significant triaxiality has already been suggested for nuclei at low spins in this mass region. And chiral band pairs, which uh, we saw in, uh, at the beginning of the talk, uh, they give a definite indication for the existence of triaxiality. These band pairs have been observed in a number of nuclei in this particular mass region. So hence uh, the mass 190 region. Our particular nucleus of choice is 187 gold, and that is primarily because of the neighboring 186 platinum nucleus, which is known to exhibit triaxial behavior. And the odd H9 uh, half proton orbital in this region is expected to lead to stabilization of triaxial shapes. So hence our choice of 187 gold. Now, to explore wobbling in 187 gold, we performed two experiments using the gamma sphere array at the Argonne National Laboratory. We used a fluorine 19 beam incident on a 174 ytterbium target to populate the levels of interest in 187 gold. 
the target that we used was a 13 milligrams per centimeter square 174 uterbium deposited on 33 milligrams per centimeter square lead 208 backing. The table here shows the uh, details of the two runs that were performed. The first run was at a beam energy of 105 MeV, while, while the second run was at an energy of 115 MeV. The number of detectors that were available to us was 57 in run one and 73 in run two. And to take advantage of increased statistics, we added up the two data sets and uh, we had a enough uh, some approximately uh, 10 to the 9 uh, triple coincidence events. After that, we use the Radware suit of codes to sort the data. And then the next step was to look at the level schemes. So part one here, we will look at some of the structures built on the Pi H9 half configuration. So this is the level scheme that was developed back in 1989 uh, by this particular group. They found the ERAS band built on the lowest pi H9 half structure, and they firmly established the spin and parity of the band head at 9 half minus at an excitation energy of 121 kV. They also found the side band with four delta I equal one connecting transitions to the ERAS band. And they reported these two bands as the two signatures of the pi H9 half state. Now, before we move forward, just a short review of what a signature partner band is. A principal axis rotation leads to sequences of delta I is equal to two bands having alternate signatures. A signature is a quantum number which is denoted by alpha and for an odd mass nucleus takes the value of plus minus one half. So a triaxial core, which is coupled to a quasi particle, in addition to wobbling bands, we also observe erast and signature partner bands. Now, how does a signature partner band actually uh, originate? So if you look here, little j, which is the angular momentum of the odd particle, instead of aligning with the short axis, it oscillates around it. So this, um, uh, this oscillation actually uh, contributes a significant uh, part of, of single particle uh, rotation of the odd uh, particle. So since the odd particle is no longer aligned with the short axis, it moves around the, sh uh, around the short axis. This leads to connecting transitions between the signature partner and the ERAS band, which are pure purely M1 in nature. Now this is in contradiction to the wobbling bands where the connecting transitions as we have seen earlier, are predominantly electric quadrupole in nature. So this is the level scheme that we developed for uh, 187 gold uh, from the present work. We saw the RAS band, which was in agreement with the previous measurement. Uh, band two was also found to be in agreement, but with increased statistics, we were able to extend this band to spin 31 half. And we also found two connecting transitions to the ERAS band. Uh, a new band labeled as band three here was found to also connect to the ERAS band via two delta is equal to one transitions. The next step, after we had looked at the level scheme was to uh, look at the spectroscopic properties of the connecting transitions. So this group back in 1989, they reported all these four connecting transitions between the two bands as mixed M1 plus E2 in nature based on their polarization and DCO ratio measurements. So uh, this statement here is actually from the original publication with the three lowest connections, 376, 461, and 544 KB marked in red. All of them have been identified as M1 plus E2 on the basis of polarization and DCO ratios. Um, they also performed some angular distributions, but they were limited by only three angles at 12, 33, and 90 degrees, and consequently precise mixing ratio uh, extraction uh, was not possible. However, with increased statistics and taking advantage of the ring-like arrangement of gamma sphere, the present work was able to perform a complete angular distribution analysis. As uh, some of you might know, gamma sphere has 17 rings with each ring at a particular angle with respect to the direction of the beam. But since gamma sphere is symmetric, we added up the symmetric uh, rings and uh, performed angular distributions at seven angles from 17.3 degrees to 90 degrees. 
Then we utilize the Markov chain Mon Monte Carlo sampling technique to extract mixing ratios from these angular distributions. We have benchmarked our method by establishing the, uh, the, uh, um, the multipolarities of some of the known pure E2 transitions using this method. So here, this is the ERAS band with two transitions that are encircled 413.7 and 491.1 kV. Both of these are known E2 transitions. On the right here are the angular distributions as were performed in the present work. The red curve is the angular distribution fit and the dotted green line corresponds to a pure delta is equal to two E2 distribution. So both of these uh, give a very small uh, mixing ratio of negative 0.03 and negative 0.02 uh, respectively. And so both of these transitions have been identified as pure E2 transitions. So. Once we were able to benchmark our current method of angular distributions using these pure E2 transitions, we moved on to look at the distributions for some of the connecting transitions between the ERAS band and uh, the band two. So here is the angular distribution for the lowest connecting transition here, which is encircled in green, 376.3 kV. Um, on the left here is the distribution plot. Again, red corresponds to the angular distribution fit and the dashed blue line is the pure delta is equal to one M1 distribution curve. From this angular distribution, we extracted a mixing ratio of negative 2.67, which corresponds to an E2 percentage of 87.7. Moving to the next higher uh, connecting transition, again, a very high percentage of E2 mixing was observed at about 89.9%. And as we move to higher connecting transitions from 461 to 544, 639, and 737, we observed that the percentage of E2 mixing kept increasing up to 95.3%. The highest connecting transition here, 855.2 kV, it was too weak. And so we could not perform a complete angular distribution analysis. However, we were able to look at the DCO-like ratios. So here, this is a plot of the DCO-like ratio versus energy. And um, a value of 0 0.8 for this ratio means a pure dipole transition, whereas a value of 1.2 means a pure quadrupole transition. If this ratio takes a value which is less than 0.8, then that means that transition is, an, um, is a mixed uh, delta equal one plus two transition with a negative mixing ratio. So here, all these uh, six points in blue, these are actually the six connecting transitions between the ERAS band and it sideband. And as predicted, all of them have a value much less than 0.8, which indicates a large negative mixing ratio. This last point, which is encircled here, corresponds to 855.2 kV. And looking at the trend of this point with respect to all the other pre uh, lower connecting transitions, this transition was also adopted as an M1 plus E2 with a high uh, percentage of E2 mixing. Now looking at the connecting transitions between this new band that the present study found and the ERAS band, so uh, 265.3 kV, which is encircled here. Now here, unlike the other uh, connections that we have recently seen, this transition actually uh, turned out to be an almost pure M1 transition with a very small E2 percentage of only 0.4. Moving to the next connection, 436.5 kV between these two bands, again, an E2 percentage of only 1%. And so both of these transitions were classified as pure M1 transitions. So, so far what we have is the ERAS band and a side band, which is shown in pink with six connecting transitions. All of them have been identified as delta I is equal to one with the predominant E2 character. Based on that, we have identified this band as the wobbling band. Now on the left, the band that is shown in red, it has two connecting transitions which have been identified as pure M1 connections. And based on that, we have identified this new band as the signature partner associated with the ERAST band. Moving forward, we then looked at the wobbling energy for the bands in question. And uh, we found that for this particular case, wobbling energy increased with increase in spin. And as we have previously seen, an increasing wobbling energy is indicative of longitudinal wobbling. So this makes 187 gold only the second case of a longitudinal wobbler. 
Uh, to further confirm our prediction, we uh, we performed some calculations uh, in, on the, in the framework of the particle rotor model using deformation parameters beta equals 0 0.23 and gamma equals 23 degrees. So on the left here is the excitation energy minus a rotor contribution for uh, the EDAS band in black, the wobbling band in blue, and the signature partner band in red. The dashed and dotted lines here correspond to the PRM calculations, and all of them are in pretty good agreement with the experiment. On the right here is the wobbling energy plot um, with the experimental points shown in black and the dashed uh, red line corresponding to PRM calculations. Again, PRM reproduces the increasing trend in wobbling energy, but its value is found to be slightly underestimated compared to the experiment. Now, this is uh, another um, important uh, factor for wobbling bands. So for wobbling bands, a high reduced E2 transition probability, B of E2 for connecting transitions is predicted. Now, since with the present uh, experiment, we were not able to do any lifetime measurements, we had to rely on the mixing ratios that we extracted from angular distributions to look at some of the reduced transition probability ratios. So uh, the top left here, that's the B of E2 out by B of E2 in ratio for the connecting transitions between the wobbling bands. And on the right here is the same ratio for the connecting transitions between the signature partner and the ERAS band. Notice that the Y scales are very different for these two plots. So while uh, this ratio takes a value of 0.7 for the connecting transitions between the wobbling bands, this ratio takes a value of about 0 0.01 for that between the signature partner and the ERAS band. So a large B of E2 out by B of E2 in ratio indicates collective quadruple excitation, and that is characteristic of wobbling bands. At the bottom here is the B of M1 out by B of E2 in ratio for uh, the connect connecting transitions between the wobbling bands on the left and the connecting transition between the signature partner and the ERAS band on the right. Um, PRM overestimates uh, this ratio for the transitions between the wobbling bands and underestimates it for the connection between the signature partner and the ERAS. And that uh, is most possibly due to some kind of incorrect mixing between the wobbling and the signature partner states. So, uh, yeah, this is just a little bit of publicity for my work. This work was published earlier last year in physical review letters and was selected to appear as a synopsis in the online journal Physics. It also appeared as a news item on Popular Mechanics, Science Daily. Um, it was selected to appear as a research highlight in Nature, Science, appeared as editor's suggestion on PRL, um, again, in some other news outlets like Yahoo News, Viz.org, ScienceNewsNet.in. There were almost 25 tweets across nine countries. So yeah, this, this work was very widely appreciated by the nuclear physics community. Um, okay, just, just a little bit of publicity for my work. Um, okay, uh, summarizing results for this part of the work, we have observed wobbling in 187 gold, which is the first such observation made in mass 190 region. We have observed two rotational bands, which are the zero and one phonon wobbling bands pair. We have also been able to observe the signature partner band associated with the ERAS band, and uh, we have identified 187 gold as a longitudinal wobbler. Now, although 133 lanthanum was the first observed uh, longitudinal wobbler, they could not observe the associated signature partner band. However, in addition to the wobbling band for 187 gold, we have also been able to observe the signature partner band. And that makes 187 gold the first case of longitudinal wobbling uh, where the wobbling band has been clearly distinguished from its associated signature partner band. Now we look at the uh, structure that is built on the pi h 11 half hole configuration. So this uh, group in 1989, in addition to the structure that we uh, saw in the first part of the talk, they observed a band structure arising from the pi h 11 half hole configuration shape coexisting with the pi h 9 half structure. They established the spin and parity uh, for the band head at 11 half minus with an excitation energy of 223.6 kV. 
um, the present work was able to observe the structure and we were able to extend the H11 half band up to spin 27 half. We also observed the side band with connecting transitions to the H11 half band. Now, although some of the transitions within this um, band were known uh, with increased statistics, uh, we have been able to revise some of the gamma placements and extend this band up to spin 21 half. Um, we also observed this other uh, side band building on top of the H11 half band. And this structure was found to connect to the H11 half band via the 709.8 keV. Now, most of the intensity was taken away by this transition. And so we could not extend the H11 half band beyond 27 half. This is the coincidence relationship um, that has been obtained by uh, a sum of all possible double gates on the transitions within the H11 half band. So looking at these coincidence relationships, we were able to establish the sequencing and multipolarities for some of the transitions. Um, and in addition to two connecting transitions between bands seven and eight, which were previously known, we have observed this third connecting transition, 647.6 kV between these two bands. Uh, similarly, for this uh, structure labeled nine, we were able to confirm some of the sequencing of these transitions. And um, we also confirmed multipolarities for these transitions using angular distributions, which we will be talking in, about in the next few slides. Okay, so the next step was to look at the spectroscopic properties of the transitions within the H11 half uh, band structure, which is shown here at the bottom right. So this table actually shows the reported multipolarities for some of these transitions by three different studies. One, two, and three, there are three different studies that were performed in the years 1989 and 1997. So if you look at the uh, first uh, entry here, 449.7 kV, which is this um, uh, lowest in-band transition within the H11 half band, connecting states 15 half minus and 11 half minus. This was reported as E2 by one and three, but reported unknown by two. Similarly, looking at 384.5 kV, which is the highest in-band transition here, connecting states 27 half and 23 half, this was reported as a dipole by study two, a mixed M1 plus E2 by study three and unknown by study one. So there was a lot of irregularity in the reported multipolarities. And so it was necessary to perform a precise angular distribution analysis and uh, confirm the spins of the states involved. So uh, down here are the six angular distributions for the six uh, in-band transitions within the structure. Again, the red curve corresponds to an angular distribution fit and the dotted green line corresponds to a pure delta I is equal to two E2 transition. For all of these uh, transitions, the extracted mixing ratio was very small. Uh, approximately negative 0.02. And so all of these transitions have been identified as uh, pure, de uh, pure delta is equal to two E2 transitions. Next, we looked at the angular distribution for the connecting transitions between these two bands. So here is the, the distribution for 526 KV, which is encircled here in green. Um, this was also reported as a mixed M1 plus E2 transition, but a precise mixing ratio was not reported. Um, with increased statistics, we performed uh, the angular distribution for this transition. And uh, here the dashed blue line is the pure delta is equal to one M1 distribution and the red is the distribution fit. We were able to extract a mixing ratio of negative 1.88 corresponding to an E2 percentage of 77.9. Um, moving on to the next uh, connecting transition here, 643 KV again, a high E2 percentage of 79.3% was obtained for this translation. Um, the third connection here, 647.5 kV was uh, too weak and we could not perform a complete angular distribution analysis. But again, uh, we, we relied on DCO-like ratios to assign a multipolarity for that transition. So coming back to the same plot that we had seen a little, just a little bit earlier, um, these points in red, they correspond to the three connecting transitions between the H11 half band and its side band. 
um, the two points here within the circle, they correspond to these uh, two connecting transitions, 643 and 647.5 kV. Now, looking at the trend of these uh, three points here, they are well below 0 0.8, again, indicating a high negative uh, mixing ratio, um, almost similar to that found for the connecting transitions between the, uh, the longitudinal wobbling band and the ERAS band based on the pi H9 half structure that we saw in the first part of the talk. So based on that, we were able to assign uh, this third connecting transition also as a delta is equal to one with the predominant electric quadrupole character. So based on this, um, we were able to identify these two bands as a possible wobbling bands candidate associated with the pi H11 half structure. Um, again, we performed uh, theoretical calculations in the framework of the particle rotor model with deformation parameters beta equals 0 0.26 and gamma equals 40 degrees. On the left here is the excitation energy versus spin for the H11 half band in black and the proposed wobbling band in blue. The dashed uh, black line and the uh, blue lines, they actually they correspond to the PRM calculations, again, showing a very good agreement with the experiment. On the right here is the wobbling energy plot for this uh, pair of bands. And most interestingly, it was found to decrease with increase in spin. Now, as we have seen earlier, a decreasing wobbling energy is indicative of transverse wobbling. PRM predicts the decreasing trend very well, and it also predicts that at spin 25 half, the transverse wobbling will collapse beyond which it converts into longitudinal wobbling. But since experimentally, we could not extend the proposed wobbling band beyond spin 21 half, we were not able to observe the experimental turnover point. Next, we looked at the reduced transition probability ratios for the connecting transitions between these two bands. On the left here is the B of E2 out by B of E2 in ratio for these connecting transitions. And on the right here is the B of M1 out by B of E2 in uh, for these same transitions. Now again, notice the very different Y scales. Uh, while the B of E2 out by B of E2 in ratio takes a value of 0 0.9, um, the same transition for B of M1 out by B of E2 in takes a value of 0 0.07. So a large B of E2 out by B of E2 in and a very small B of M1 out by B of E2 in suggest a very promising wobbling candidate for this H11 half band pair. Now, although uh, we were not able to um, determine the experimental trend because we only have three connecting transitions and mixing ratio ratios for only the lower two, um, we, 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 we could not look at the experimental uh, trend and therefore more statistics are needed to verify our claim. So uh, summarizing this part of the talk, we have identified two rotational bands, which are the zero and one phonon wobbling bands pair arising from a pi H 11 half hole configuration. This is also the very first case of hole like wobbling. A decreasing wobbling energy with spin has established these bands as exhibiting transverse wobbling. Now, this is the most interesting part of the study. On the left here is the wobbling energy plot for the uh, bands built on the pi H9 half structure, which was the part one of uh, this talk. As we saw, this uh, these pair of bands indicate long longitudinal wobbling, whereas the band pairs built on the pi H11 half structure indicates transverse wobbling. So this makes 187 goal the first case of coexistence of longitudinal and transverse wobbling. Now, this is important because this indicates triaxial shape co coexistence. Um, there have been studies for triaxial shape coexistence, but all of them have been based on multiple chiral doublet bands. And this is the first case of a nucleus where triaxial shape coexistence could be studied on the basis of um, coexisting wobbling bands. So yeah, uh, concluding, we have investigated wobbling motion in 187 gold nucleus. We have performed angular distribution measurements that enabled the extraction of precise mixing ratio values. 187 gold is the first established case of longitudinal wobbling where the wobbling band has been clearly distinguished from the associated signature partner band. We have also identified 
uh, an H11 half band structure, which is a possible transverse wobbling candidate we have performed. Theoretical calculations in the framework of the particle rotor model, and they have been found to be in good agreement with the experiment. So the takeaway point from this talk would be that 187 gold is the first nucleus indicating coexistence of longitudinal and transverse wobbling. But of course, we need further experimental efforts to establish this claim. Finally, I would like to thank all my collaborators and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, you can put them in the chat or um, you can um, just unmute yourself and ask. Um, can I? Go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you very much for a very nice presentation and congratulations for the beautiful work. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question regarding your uh, particle rotor model calculations and this discrepancy with the M1. So do you have any quenching on the Coriolis term uh, which you use? Uh, because that is also related to some extent to the magnetic moment. And I was wondering if you play with that uh, in your results. Mm -hmm. And then the other question, which is something that I guess goes way back to the beginning of this wobbling uh, physics, is the fact that this data is very compelling and shows a strong uh, evidence for this triaxiality. Um, have you looked on whether the even even core shows a level scheme which could be amenable of the description in the particle rotor model, obviously the core part, with the parameters that you use for the odd mass? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for 187 uh, gold, the triaxial core is 186 platinum. And based on the energy staggering between the uh, first two plus and the first four plus and the second two plus states, we have uh, seen that there is some triaxiality existing in that particular nucleus. And um, um, we did not study 186 platinum in very much detail, but with the deformation parameters that we used to perform our calculations for 187 gold, we were able to reproduce the B of E2 for the first uh, two plus in 186 platinum. Okay. Very good, very mm -hmm. good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes, I would like to echo what Augustus said. That these are beautiful data and congratulations on the exposure the results got. It's always good um, for the field as a whole. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Oh, I have a question in the chat from Timothy Gray. It says, I believe all the examples of wobbling nuclei you talked about had an odd proton rather than an odd neutron. Is there a physical reason for this or is it just a coincidence? Um, so actually 105 palladium, which is the first observation in mass 100 region that is based on an odd neutron configuration. And uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's no physics reason as such. I think it's just a coincidence that all the observed wobblers, most of them uh, so far, we have only found them based on an odd proton configuration. But yeah, 105 palladium was the first case of an odd neutron uh, configuration. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any other questions coming and um, I mean, this is the last chance if you have a burning question. Otherwise, uh, you can contact Nirupama directly. Ah, yeah. Uh, did you perform angular distribution from your triplet data, from your triple data, sorry? Oh, um, so we, um, after we added up the two data sets, we um, sorted the data into matrices and cubes. We used the cube to 
develop our level scheme, but we use the matrix for our angular distribution me measurements so that we can place a gate on a transition below the transition of interest, clean up the spectra a little bit, and uh, then perform angular distributions. So, yeah. Okay, did that answer your question? All happy? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, hello, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. So, so that means it is not a clearly angular distribution. It is a gated angular distribution or correlation, we can say. So, the, we we have performed tests where we saw that putting a gate on a transition below the transition of interest still preserves the angular distribution measurement. And we also looked at some of the stronger uh, transitions where we performed angular distributions using singles. So once we were able to benchmark our method using both of these, we then performed gated angular distributions. Does okay, okay. So have that? you checked that in your experiment? Yes, yes, we have, yes. Have you checked? these things in your experience oh okay okay so and i, I just ask one little thing about that in your 187 you have observed a longitudinal obling based on proton h9 hub so Correct. can you explain that from a geometrical picture because uh, the gold is a 79 number of neutron so it is below j equal to l gap so the odd proton goes into the lower means low omega orbital of H9 half, right? So if I try to visualize the geometrical picture, it will give me the transverse picture. So can you explain the longitudinal picture of uh, your uh, in 187 gold from this geometrical perspective? Is it possible? Yeah, so uh, basically if you, um look into uh, the paper that we have published in PRL, we actually made did some calculations and uh, we figured out that this odd H9 half proton that we are talking about actually originates from the middle of a half-filled orbital. And uh, this paper by Frondorf and Dunau, they predict longitudinal wobbling for odd uh, particles mm -hmm. arising from the middle of a half-filled orbital. So that's actually uh, how uh, uh, longitudinal wobbling comes about in this nucleus. So yeah, this is the paper uh, where I would refer you to yeah. to know uh, to you know look at the geometrical picture a little bit more in detail. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Yeah. Okay, there's one more question in the chat. Uh, what's the meaning of DCO like ratios? Uh, yes. Is it ADO ratio? Uh, I'm glad for that question. I have a backup slide just for that question. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, okay, just give me a minute to go to that slide. Okay. So uh, DCO ratios, that's the uh, ratio that most people are you know, aware of, whereas DCO-like ratio. So the difference is in the first expression that you see here. So while a DCO ratio, uh, you put gates on uh, both, uh, you know, you put a gate on the first gamma transition at two detectors, both at different angles. Whereas for a DCO-like ratio, it is more inclusive it uh, is looking at the intensity of gamma two with a gate on gamma one on all the detectors. So DCO-like ratio does not depend on the transition that is gated on. We use DCO-like ratios for more weaker transitions because since we are gating on all the, uh, the since we are gating on gamma one on all the detectors, it is more gate inclusive. It provides us uh, the opportunity to work with a little more statistics and um, so yeah, so the transition of interest, it has greater intensity and it does not depend on uh, the particular gate that we are getting on. We can get above the transition of interest, we can get below the transition of interest, it will not uh, really make a difference. The only problem with DCO-like ratios is it does not give a direct uh, measurement of uh, the mixing ratio because for mixed transitions, DCO-like ratios can take 
a very wide range um, of uh, you know numbers, but uh, we use DCO like ratios to look at the transitions that were very weak, but we were able to look at the trend of all the previously, uh, you know, previous connecting transitions where we have been able to extract precise mixing ratios. So, yeah, so that's DCO like ratio. We it is more get, uh, it is more uh, inclusive. It uh, provides us provides the transition of interest with greater intensity, and it is independent of the gate. So that's what DCO like ratio is. Are, are you happy with the answer? No. Okay. Can um, I maybe ask one more? Go for it. Yeah, so <clears throat> I was wondering, <clears throat> sort of prompted by the recent call for proposals at Atlas and the possible uh, use of Retina, whether um, you think uh, there is something where the polarization capabilities of retina, which obviously gamma sphere does not have, mm -hmm. could shed more light into the, I think the evidence is very compelling so far, so I'm not so sure, but maybe you thought about it. Yeah, definitely. It would actually be very helpful if we are able to do that, because um, I remember from the first uh, wob uh, case of wobbling that we found in 135 Presidemium that was actually found before uh, I joined Notre Dame, but um, our group had to go back to India and perform uh, an experiment with the Inga array to perform angular, uh, to perform polarization measurements. Um, but um, yeah, if uh, you know, if we had a facility here, we where we could do both angular distributions and polarization measurements, that would be an added benefit. Uh, currently, we are using uh, just the coincidence relationships and the connections between different bands of uh, different parities to determine the multipolarities. Um, but yeah, I mean, if we are mm -hmm. well, you know, at some point, yeah, think it about it. Gratina uh, mm -hmm. uh, with twelve quads uh, approaches the power of gamma sphere in some ways and it has the capability of the polarization measurement so yeah that would be very helpful good thank you well thank you i think we've got through all the questions in the chat and we're coming close to the hour so um i'd uh, like to thank Mira Palmer once more for this excellent talk and uh, I will virtually clap for everyone. And, um, and we'll see you in two weeks time um, when we will have Mansi Saxana from, um, hosted by Ohio University talking about a beta delay proton emission of uh, Zinc 57. So thank you all again for joining us. Bye.